Hey guys, this is Butch from the Vintage Media Grading Podcast. And before we start, I just want to give a shameless plug to Vintage Media Grading. VMG is your source for grading, authenticating, and slabbing your precious vinyl records. In addition, we offer a host of other services, including cleaning and sticker removal, as well as soft grading, which is a way to get your albums graded, but still allow you to spin your records and listen to your tunes. Come visit us at www.vmgvinyl.com to place your orders, or feel free to contact us at info at vmgvinyl.com. Hope you enjoy the podcast. And we are here, uh, the episode 11 of the Vintage Media Grading, the podcast. Uh, I am here with uh, co-founders of VMG, Chad and Paul Brayman. Uh, Andrew Hoffman is on vacation this week, so he's sitting it out. Um, we are happy to be joined by Nate Goyer from The Vinyl Guide. Welcome, Nate. Hello, hello. Good to All see right. you guys. Happy to have you. And Nate sounds great. Chad still hasn't gotten a legitimate microphone, unfortunately. So, um, but he promises that he'll get one for next time. <laughs> you you have my word. Great. The last nice. time you uh, you'll be dealing with this audio. All right. It's too bad nobody well, can hear your word. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Nate Goyer is the host of perhaps the best vinyl. A podcast available. Um, I would say it's the best po vinyl podcast available, but I haven't listened to all of them, so I have to. You know, as an objective third party, which we at VMG are objective third parties. <laughs> very political, Butch. Very political. Yeah, <laughs> we are uh, objective third parties. Uh, so I can only say that, as far as I know, it is the best <laughs> podcast about vinyl records. Uh, great guests, uh, super knowledgeable, a bit of a. Uh, should I say mentor to uh, Chad, Paul, and I, because we really did listen uh, to his uh, podcast for a long time before we started our own and have uh, attempted to copy the best parts of it and probably failing. But we've got time. We've got time. Like it's, it's a work in progress. So likely failing. <laughs> likely, yeah. All right, Nate, um, What's new with the podcast? Anything, any new exciting uh, things happening that you can oh, introduce boy. to our, our listener? Well, you, you know, you really <laughs> make me blush with that <laughs> intro. Um, uh, look, I, and, and it's not a, it's, it's not a, a black box here. I'm more than happy to share any guidance or quote unquote wisdom that I've gained over the last nine years or something like that on the podcast. If you want, um, what's new with the podcast. We just keep, keep rolling um every week we talk to some to another artist uh or somehow record influencer vinyl influencer about um rare records about their collection if they are if they still have a collection sometimes i'll interview someone who you know is a really interesting guest i think from a rare record perspective and as an artist but when I ask them about records, they're like, I haven't had those in 20 years. So, um, so every week it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's another guest. And uh, who did I have last week? Oh, Richard Patrick, a filter. Um, and yeah, that then, was a great, uh, that was a great interview. Oh, thank you. Thank you. He, um, there's uh, yeah, I've got quite a few lined up. Um, when's this one going to go out? Any idea? Uh, it takes me about, a, usually I'll do the editing on Sundays um, however, mm -hmm. we just did our last recording four days ago. So this Sunday, I will be doing the editing from the one from Tuesday. And I probably wow. won't get to edit this one until next Sunday. So probably a week from Monday. Got it. Okay. Easy. Uh, because then that means we'll be going live with an interview with Jack Douglas. And uh, Jack Douglas is quite a, quite a well-known producer uh, amongst you know, Discovering Cheap Trick, you know, and of course going through that whole Live at Budokan 
But uh, he also produced uh, several Aerosmith albums. What I think is Aerosmith's kind of the, the high, high watermark, Rocks, Toys in the Attic. Right. Um, he spent a lot of studio time, you know, working with the likes of The Who. And he ultimately produced uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono's final album, Double Fantasy. So we talk quite a bit about that. And he's involved in a, in a, in a current band called Silver Plains, which is pretty phenomenal. So yeah, that's an exciting one. But yeah, I've got uh, I've got a few more lined up. Um, every every day is like Christmas to me. I I get up and being in Australia, the the mail the email comes in kind of late. So when I wake up in the morning, I check my email. There's generally about thirty emails, you know, twenty eight of them junk, and two of them talking about a next guest. And you know, sometimes I get some big names. Sometimes you know, it's uh, I get some links to music and. That's all good too. Nice. Great. So for our listener, uh, also known as Chad's mom. <laughs> um, Get a microphone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so for our listeners, uh, if you could just give us a quick little rundown as to, you know, how let's start with how you got uh, started into collecting vinyl records. And then we'll get into a little bit of your, your start into podcasting. Sure, sure. So I, I look ever since I was a little kid, records were huge for me. I was the youngest of four, so um, I got to watch. And you know, raised in the seventies, I got to watch my brothers and sisters really have this social cachet around music. And like I remember the day Houses of the Holy came out, and my brother brought it home on eight track. You know, it's my my siblings were very musically focused and so it became very important to me obviously my view of the world was through them and music and their appreciation of music um and my father would take me out every week on his errands and we'd go to the drugstore it wasn't a record store but a drugstore in missouri and um every week he would buy me a 45 so he'd spend a dollar you know there was the rack of 45s each one was a dollar you just pick one it's a dollar and so I'd come home every week with a 45 and I had a collection of them, a little box of them. I cataloged them. I'd spend hours just looking at them, you know, memorizing the running time for share half breed, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> and, um, and music just, I mean, it, it stuck with me for years and years because of those family moments, you know, knowing what you do about things like, you know, uh, psychology and where you get your values and your world perspective that was fully baked in at a very early age, but I didn't get super serious about record collecting until I moved to Australia. I moved here in 2001 and, um, CDs here were tremendously expensive, um, 30 or $40. Right. And, uh, but I could go to the, to the used, uh, you know, to the swap meet, every Saturday and buy records for 50 cents each. And I started rediscovering my love of music and which I'd put down for a while. I, I, there were, there were years where I wasn't nearly as into music as I used to be. And, and come to think of it, you know, looking back on it, it was because the CD wasn't in this personal format. It wasn't in this, this, um, you know, package that I was used to. And it, and it also didn't sound as great CDs to me, never really hit my ear the same way vinyl did. So uh, I kind of got moved away from music when I moved to Australia and I started getting records again, cause they were cheap. I rediscovered my love for it. And that's when I started kind of going two feet into it. And, um, I was also traveling quite a bit. So I'd try as I'd travel, I'd bring back records, you know, that, uh, again, I was fortunate enough to build my collection before 2010, uh, when I could still afford to do it. Um, but yeah, up to this day, I still, you know, that, that I, whenever I travel, it's not about what beach I'm going to be on or, or any activity other than <laughs> oh, what kind of record shops are in this neighborhood or in right. this spot. Of- Listening to your podcast, I know you're into the nuances of everything. So as you're collecting involved, have you gotten, are you still seeking out just bands you like, or are you still, or are you looking for particular variants and some of the nuanced things that probably some of our listeners and uh, certainly the three of us 
are into? Sure. That's a good question because I think what I'm looking for always evolves. I'll go to a, um, uh, I, I used to want to be a, be a, what do you call it? A, collect the whole catalog, a completist. Um, I wanted to do that. And so, and by doing so, I, I built up a lot of records that I really wasn't that fond of. I, I discovered like black Sabbath, black Sabbath has an amazing track record early in their career and then becomes really spotty. But I felt I needed to get all the, you know, all of the records to have them. I, I felt compelled to, but there were so many records I wasn't listening to and I didn't really even like many of them. Um, so uh, that kind of, once I kind of discovered that in myself, I started changing my pattern. Um, I, there was a couple albums where I'd always try to get multiple variants. Um, you know, oh, I want the Peru version of, you know, Led Zeppelin II, or I want this version or that version. And then to me, that became a a difficult path because then I was just buying the same music over and over. It wasn't different, right? I wasn't learning anything. I was just hoarding things at that point. That's the way I felt about myself. Like, I, I don't need a a you know uruguay version of pink floyd metal or something like that you know it, it's i my uk or us one does fine so then i moved beyond that now i'm to the point to where i have pretty much everything i like or i liked but i'm really into discovering new music now so i really try to push myself to buy something that i haven't heard or i i just learned about like noi noi the band i i'd never spent any time with them and Two weeks ago, I, I was in a record shop and they had two of the Noi albums. And I'm like, okay, well, that's, let's take those home with me. I, I'm going to learn something about those. So that's that's where I'm at now, really trying to discover new new music, new things, and trying to find the, I call it chasing the goosebumps, trying to find that next that next artist that's really going to you know do it for me. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, funny, I just want a little aside. You mentioned how expensive CDs were. And it's funny, I was just thinking that the other day. Uh, I was listening to the radio and uh, a Goo Goo Dolls song came on um, from the album Dizzy Up the Girl. And I was remembering that when I was 21 years old, my college roommate and I split that CD. That's how <laughs> poor we were. <laughs> and that's we both were like, hey, I like this. You want to go halves on this CD? I think he actually has it. Um and then I remember one time somebody at an ice cream shop I worked at gave me a $20 tip, and I was so excited, and I went and stopped at Walmart, and I was like, I'm just going to find a CD because they were $20, which is now, like, uh, it's shocking that we would spend $20. $20 back then was like, you know, $30, $40 now, and I bought yeah. Filter. It's funny you should say that, and I and <laughs> Filter was the one I bought for $20. I think I, uh, that was absurd. You're a huge um, fan of Hey Man, Nice Shot. I was actually, that song was great. That was a great song. That <laughs> yeah. song still fires me up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, so in between your growing up with a love of music and your uh, becoming a, a vinyl collector, you did have a little experience of your own with actually making music. And oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So that, tell well, us about that. Sure. As a, so, <laughs> As a teenager, like I think many teenagers of my age, um, wanted to be a rock star, wanted to be some sort of musician uh, for a living. That was my plan. I didn't have any other plan. I had no idea what would happen outside of that plan. But um, <clears throat> I, you know, I took guitar lessons as a teenager and I got good enough to get in a band and started forming a band, playing high school parties. And, um, you know, it, uh, it, it seemed plausible. The only thing was, is that I, you know, I, I didn't practice near enough. I was more into the idea of playing music than actually playing music. And, um, but uh, my high school band, we, we decided to make a record. I think we, we saw a, an ad in a magazine of some sort. I think in California, there was Rainbow Records, Rainbow, no W, R-A-I-N-B-O, very popular record pressing plant in Los Angeles. And they were advertising a deal to make records. And we were like, all you need is money to make records. You don't need connections. You don't need any. You just need money. Well, we could find money. And uh, so several of us who worked at Burger King or Arby's or wherever, you know, we worked at them, we pooled our money together 
and we, you know, oh, we could, we can make a record, but first we need to make a recording. So now we have to learn about recording studios and we found a recording studio that would do it cheap. So yeah, we went in, we recorded two songs and you know, we only had two songs, I think at that time. And then we got a record press. We got a thousand records, copies of this record pressed. And uh, that was in high school, which it was kind of cool in high school, but you know, it, uh, um, it pretty soon learned that it's more, you need more than just printing a record to, to, to make something happen with it. Of course, right. nothing ever happened to the band, mm-hmm. but, uh, and then all of us got stuck with an, you know, we split up, we split up a thousand records four ways. So each of us got 250 records and most of us by the end of, you know, within five, 10 years had taken a lot of those records to the dump and, uh, <laughs> you know, cause we we're just carrying them around. So, uh, yep. yeah, but that, that record now is uh, pretty hard to find. It's actually quite, uh, quite, uh, quite rare. What was the name? That, that's what. I, uh, oh, the ahead. band was Metropolis. The band was called Metropolis. We 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 thought ourselves as like some sort of Kansas, some sort of progressive rock, and it was yeah, it was <laughs> laughable. But um, uh, the band was called Metropolis, and the song there were two songs: "Time Heals Everything" and "The Raven." <laughs> Only recently that record was kind of rediscovered, revived, and it's part of the scrap metal uh, series on uh, um, from Writing Easy Records. Scrap metal, of course, <laughs> of course. And uh, so, for yeah. those who can't see, who uh, which is everybody listening, uh, he's <laughs> right now. <laughs> Nate is holding up a, a BMG graded scrap metal, uh, which looks quite beautiful. Very impressive. When, I keep it right here. Whenever we, w- once we eventually get our seven inch slabs in production, that that seven inch that you mentioned is collectible, <laughs> quite collectible. And it's, I don't know if it's just your, your rabid uh, podcast following that's driving the price up or, or, or what, but it's a, um, it goes, it's, it's hard to find. It's not, uh, and it, it sells for a decent amount considering. I haven't oh, I haven't checked prices things. lately, but but I did hear from some some uh, old classmates because we used to sell them for a dollar or two dollars at school. There was a liquor store across the street from our high school, which I worked at, and it had it in the window. People can come in and buy it for two bucks. It, you know, I mean, I think we sold fourteen. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. But, uh, but yeah, there's some old uh, old uh, roommates, especially when Facebook first came back on, and uh, or first Facebook came on, and we all started reconnecting. And oh, I got your record. I just sold it for eighty bucks or whatever, you know. It's, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah it's, what what I really learned from that is just the um, just the planning and the execution, and you know, going through that whole thing. It was it's a big project, especially for like a teenager who's just kind of feeling their way through it. So um, I think it was overall a great experience. It's just, yeah, it was, uh, you know, the really, really good lesson on, on, you know, how to, how to, how to make something happen for yourself. Yeah. Well, 14 cool. purchases. I mean, uh, we're looking forward to getting 14 listeners at some point and we'll be, <laughs> yep. excited. We're ha- we'll be excited for that. <laughs> we're about halfway there. You bet. Have- okay. <laughs> yeah. It's a um, grind. You can dude, yeah. if you start if you start looking at the thing, if you start looking at metrics, especially early on, it's it's really hard to get up in the morning and do it. Yeah. The <laughs> the good news is that um, you know, I, I have a good feeling about the quality of our listeners, and I'm pretty sure there is probably a a, a very important uh, music producer listening to this right now who's ready to give you your big break. And oh. Metropolis, their big break. So yeah. getting the band back together, <laughs> and uh, we'll let you know when they contact us because I'm pretty sure they will. We, we we're pretty important here in the states. I understand that. I understand that. Yeah, Butch. Yeah. Um, the the uh, 
well, I was talking to, you know, well, I still remain very good friends with the, with the, with the guys in the band. And we, we've talked about, you know, how I guess naive we were, you know, growing up in the suburbs of, you know, California of San Jose, by then I'd moved to San Jose and, um, like we, we thought, oh, yeah, we're going to be in a band. We, you know, we're going to go on tour. We're going to do these things, but we never really, really did. And we were so used to very comfortable lives. Uh, if if you, you, you ever read like the history of black flag where they just get in the van, drive around and play, you know, we, within three days of getting in the van, we would have wanted to come right back home. We'd be hungry. We'd have no idea. You know, we've never missed a meal. And all of a sudden we're, yeah, we. I don't think we were prepared for the sort of sacrifice that that that, that life would have meant. Totally. Um, so my next question is: uh, Talk to us a little bit about how you got started into podcasting. Is it just serendipitous that you have such a great voice for radio, and and then you just kind of waltzed into uh, podcasting and 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 thought this is this is perfect, uh, you know, for uh, such a perfect radio voice or was there a history of radio beforehand? So, uh, yeah, very observant because through this whole metropolis thing, through playing in bands, I, I discovered something about myself. It was hard. I didn't admit it at the time, but I knew that I, I, I was more fascinated with the recording with the uh, engineering process than with the actual music. I'd rather, I'd rather spend the afternoon fucking around. Oh, can I, can I curse? Is that okay? Is that a, okay? Okay. Sorry, Chad's mom. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Screwing around with like the four track and, you know, put stringing the effects pedals together. I was more fascinated with that than actually practicing. Um, and looking back, you know, it was very clear. I was more of an engineer than a, than a musician than an artist um and then i ended up getting a job at a music shop and i started putting together a little home recording studio you know an eight track reel to reel studio you know not super sophisticated but not cheap right and um learning how to work that equipment um and to pay for it i started doing radio ads so I did. Uh, I I connected with the two major rock stations in the area, um, in San Jose, and I would do ads for them. And I would do the really weird ads, the ads for things like you know, um, you know, shops that sold bongs, and you know, they they wanted something kind of weird and goofy, and so I'd do those sort of ads. And um, I started getting a pretty good reputation of doing it um, to the point to where the radio st- one of the radio stations in Monterey offered us a a slot. And so I started doing that. And of course it wasn't long before that I got fired from that for, you know, you have to be outrageous, but not that outrageous. And so, um, but yeah, I think I've always, I always, from that point on, or when I was doing, um, uh, you know, putting the studio together, I kind of recognized my voice as a potential asset. And then that's what I've, you know, yeah. And, and yeah. by the way, when I, I met my wife, who was living in Australia and I was living in California, we spent the first three months, you know, on the phone and communicating that way. I'm convinced that um, my voice played a major role in that. My, you know, I, I, don't, <laughs> I, I, I truly exceeded my genetic potential with her. And so I, if it wasn't for my voice <laughs> and her bad eyesight, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> So. It is. A great, I mean, it's a great voice. It's a it's a it's you know, it's going to be hard for us to ever match your podcast because you've got a voice for radio and we've got faces for radio and it doesn't work. that You know, it doesn't work as well. So I, I'm hearing your voice. I'm not hearing anything wrong with the voice. OK, so but it's just, uh, if, 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 you know, uh. it's just uh, yeah, just um, or maybe you're just better. I don't know where we're, we're, you're it, to let the fans know who haven't listened. Uh, your podcast is um, excellent. Goes deep into vinyl records. Uh, excellent interviews, and it is called the Vinyl Guide. So, as we get into talking about a band, I just want to give that one last plug. You can find it anywhere on uh, Apple, iTunes, Spotify, uh, iHeartRadio, wherever you get your your uh, podcasts, and you won't be disappointed. It's fantastic. First time I listened to it, I, I actually remember listening to it for the first time, and 
calling or texting Chad. I was driving mm-hmm. far in Massachusetts and said, you got to listen to this guy. This, this is really good. This guy knows a lot of stuff. And so yeah, we immediately, was- the three of us really immediately started listening, um, you know, early on in your, uh, in your uh, time of doing the podcast and we've been listening ever since. So thanks yeah. a lot for that, for filling up my hours on the lawnmower and my <laughs> long drives. It's fantastic. The, the one, one thing that set that apart, I mean, there's a lot of them out there but when I was fishing around looking for a vinyl podcast, besides the fact that your guests are, are awesome. You, you pull really interesting guests. The production quality was the highest that you, you could expect from a podcast. So it just sounded professional and it's, you know, it's easy on the ears when you have good production quality, uh, unlike ours. Uh, but it was, it was, a, uh, and then the, the content itself was great too. But I mean, the first thing is if it's hard to listen to people aren't going to stick around. And that's something that always that annoyed me about a lot of podcasts is the levels are wrong. And, you know, you listen to one guy and he's like, mm-hmm kind of in the background the other guys look right up front and you know and, and so look, by the way, I, as i'm as i'm going through this and naturally after almost 500 episodes or 450 episodes or something i listen as i go and i i'm like oh that's wrong i'm gonna have to fix that that's you know it's it's natural i'm not hearing anything that really needs to be fixed here yeah chad's no, microphone it's but it's, <laughs> yeah. it's not, that's it's a, not that's a it's not a deal breaker but um yeah, look, I, I, and I listen like, and I spent a lot of my time editing. I was talking to someone the other day and, and um, yeah, the amount of editing that's required to do a podcast, especially one where, you know, you're as OCD as me and you want to balance everything and make it sound perfect. It's, it's, it's quite, quite extensive, but, um, but yeah, I've heard a lot of similar feedback to what you said, Chad, you know, it's very easy on the ears, which is where I want it to be. I mean, if you're preaching to audiophiles, you have to be. You, you gotta, right. you gotta, you gotta bring in that A game pretty early. So, for the listeners who aren't, who are new, uh, what we do here usually is we pick a band or artist to focus on, and when we have a guest, we like to leave that up to the guest to introduce us to a band they may be passionate about, some vinyl records they might be passionate about. So, when we ask Nate. Uh, what band he'd like to discuss, he picked the Melvins. And so, um, you know, we are certainly rock fans, um, although admittedly, I think the three of us have have always aired on the side of more pop, you know, popular bands and haven't gotten too far down um, into the, uh, into punk artists as we wish we probably should have or could have. So it's great to have someone who has some knowledge that we probably don't about a band that is uh, super important and about a band for whom I have bought some records in the past when I find them uh, simply because they're historically important and I like to throw them on and listen to them. Um, And so um, we're kind of thrilled, the three of us are thrilled that you're here to talk about them because it's probably going to be information that is certainly new to our listeners and very likely to be new to us so thanks for bringing them uh into our earphones here so um why don't you tell me tell us a little bit about you know what turns you on to the melvins and and how long you've been listening to them and give Mm. us the down low sure look i'll always talk about melvins and by the way it could be melvins or the melvins um because as soon as you said melvins i said oh i already made a major no 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 no. so so here's the thing i i had you know i've always called them melvins the records are melvins and sometimes if you say the melvins it's like calling vinyl vinyls you know some people's ears (laughs) wait a minute that's you know you should be that's melvins not the melvin but on their latest album the ones coming up it says the melvins and I actually had an opportunity. Uh, Dale Crover, who's drummer of Melvin's, was on the show a couple weeks ago. And I said, "Okay, well, I noticed the Melvin's. The Melvin's." He's like, "Use either." <laughs> it was. It, I remember that episode, and it was. Uh, it was funny because we obsess over little things that we think are important, and when you asked him that, he was like, "Yeah, 
yeah, the Melvins, Melvins, whatever. It, it yeah. was like, it didn't seem like, it was way more important to us than the actual band. Yeah. Well, and and, and I, I think they're probably used to people like myself. Like, I'm probably a very annoying music fan because I want to know these sort of things. And I'll ask them these sort of things. And I, I think that they are, if they, if, if, if Mel, if Buzz or Dale or those guys were listening to this podcast, they'd probably be super embarrassed for a lot of the things I, I'm about to say. And they'd probably think I'm an idiot, which, you know, is, uh, is, is fair. Uh, but my appreciation of their band, I think that they, I think Melvin's are one of the most important, certainly American rock bands in music history. And the influence they've had is tremendous. Like Butch, I'm seeing the records behind you, Pearl Jam, Temple of the Dog, Mother Love Bone. Slide, I know your guys slide it, love slide them. it oh. over a little bit, Butch, so we can see the rest. Not the other way. So there's actually oh, a oh, Melvin's mention. Yeah, scroll. Oh, I can't see it anymore. There, there's the there deep sex record. Yeah, yeah, that's, I, that's Melvin's I think first. That's uh, the Melvin's. Yep, yep. first uh, first appearance. That's right. So, like you, then, like, the path you were going down, extremely influential and important, and in that part of the world where the music scene really was festering something huge in the next, you know, probably five to six years before you know ninety one when everything exploded, but they were right there in the, they, they were at the at ground zero, so to speak, of of that whole movement, and that that's yeah. how I know the Melvins more as as just a historical piece than necessarily their music. The Melvins. Okay. It says the Melvins. We're looking at the deep the- fix compilation on CZ Records and it says and it the says- Melvins. Okay. okay. <laughs> you, you're forgiven, Butch. I forgave you a while ago, but your sins are absolved. You can have- okay. Now his wife is gonna have to hang up that picture again. No, I can hang it up. <laughs> <laughs> she actually always takes it. She actually it, it frustrates me because I think it looks so cool. And then she has her professional meetings that she sits in the same desk, and she always pulls it down. And I'm like, you, your, you know, your <laughs> students and stuff. They probably think that our students wouldn't know Pearl Jam from anything, but uh, I think it looks cool. But she always pulls the it down. Like, oh, maybe they'll know the <laughs> right. Maybe they'll know the, the Melvins. <laughs> so all right. So yes. I interrupted you, Nate. Sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. It, look again. I just think they're they're incredibly important. The bands that we know and love, and that are popular in the, you know, in the wider atmosphere, um, a lot of them took direct, direct um, influence from Melvins. Um, it's pretty well known. Kurt Cobain, he was a huge Melvins fan. He used to work for Melvins, like being a roadie. Um, of course, you know the debate of what exactly he did as a roadie is. You know, I don't know how how I can't really see him humping amps, you know, three times his weight up flight of stairs. But I'm sure he helped by driving the van around. And he was certainly friends of theirs. Um, uh, Dale Crover was uh, is on uh, a few songs on Bleach, uh, you know, as they you know, as Nirvana was kind of going through their personnel changes and lineups, getting that all sorted. Uh but um, but yeah, he he Kurt Cobain actually identified himself as a Melvin's roadie well into his Nirvana career. He would he would it's, he he loved to be aligned with the band. And yeah, didn't it, the, uh, and Buzz and some and the rest of the Melvins they kind of paid tribute to him on their first single, right? It, the, on the label itself, it says kind of in the background of it says bands people we can't forget, and it has Kurt Cobain and Kurt Novoselic. Oh, okay. but yeah, if you look in the like zoom in on the original seven inch, the six songs EP, mm-hmm. so it was really early before Nirvana was even a band. There's a wow, okay, let me see, I if, I find an, let me see if I can find an image out of it and share it. Yeah, it's, I was right. just gonna Paul stole my thunder. I was gonna say it was the <laughs> for the Nirvana completists out there, I believe it's the first time Kurt Cobain is mentioned on any sort of vinyl record. And it's in print. It, there's no no audio. He's not on the record, but his name's printed on it. Okay. The first acknowledgement and kind of music. Okay. Yep. Interesting. Oh, I, I did not know that. There you go. Bring in the facts, Paul. Do you have that EP? The six song? Oh, Easy As It Was? Okay. I don't know. I don't have this. 
I, I see it quite frequently in the collector circles. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, I've never been able to get my hands on one. Yeah, and I'm like sure. the background of the label that's kind of in faded gray print. It mentions Kurt Cobain and, and Kurt Cobain, so both of them. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Kurt Cobain, Nova Sells. Yep. As well as Steve Turner and uh, some of the guys from Mud Honey, it looks like. Yep. Yeah. A lot of kind of cool names on there. This was 86. So Nirvana was not even formed yet, yet really. Right. So. Someone named Skeeter. Um, so yeah. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That just goes to prove, you know, they were there ground zero. Um, and another thing I love about Melvin's Melvin's, they continually evolve. The basis is generally buzz, uh, guitar and vocals and Dale drums, um, and some guitars here and there. And then they have the bass player spot has rotated quite a bit. Um, recently Steve McDonald of Red Cross and off has, uh, start has filled that spot pretty consistently. Um, but, uh, you know, they'll do a few albums with one lineup, then they'll get a, a few different musicians in at one point they absorbed the band big business into Melvin's. And so there was two drummers, uh, along, you know, uh, and that to me, that's one of my favorite eras of Melvin's, but they'll do a couple albums in one configuration and then they'll change it up and do another few albums or another project in a different configuration. Um, their new album that they have coming out uh, later this year, Tarantula Heart is they, they rather than learning the songs, rehearsing the songs and recording the songs, they went into the studio and just recorded a bunch of fragments. And then they, afterward, they put those fragments together into songs. So they're continually innovating and changing things up, which really keeps me very interested as you take a band like ACDC who kind of, once they struck that formula, they just kept repeating that formula. And that's fine. It's worked well for them. Um, but who here really kind of listens to things like rock or bust with the same enthusiasm as when you heard, you know, back in black in the day. Right. To me, it's, right. you know, it gets less interesting uh, as it goes. But with Melvin's, and they're continually changing things up, which keeps me keeps me interested. Yeah, it is and one there, of those I'm things the, that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Chad. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I'm not I'm not. From, as familiar with their more recent catalog, but their their latest album, right? It has it, it's a huge difference from a lot of their early work, where the songs are are like epic songs, like 15, 20 minute songs, or, or even more. And I know on the Deep Six album, they uh, they have four songs, and two of them are less than forty seconds. So, so yeah. it's a quite a, quite a change from you know, where they were in the eighties to what they're producing now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's not to say that their next album may be 50 one minute songs, you know, it, it wouldn't right. be out of character for them to do something that sort of experimental. In fact, when I was, I was, I've had Melvin's on the show several times. Um, and, you know, Buzz and I were talking about, they do stunts. Like one of the things they would do is um, like they played all 50 states in 50 days. So they would just, you know, they would do 50 gigs in a row, each different states. And, and they just decided to, to do that as kind of a lark. And then they started kind of really thinking about like, you know, we could actually do this. And their booking agent got on it. And I think there's a video available on it, but, or they'll do a book. You know, they'll, they'll do these different kind of projects that I think are really interesting. And again, just continually breaking their own mold. And a, a lot of their more recent releases are really geared toward the, the collector. Like you're getting cool packaging, really unique vinyl colors, variants, things that, you know, guys like us appreciate. I, I don't know if the regular... Well, I, I do think the the masses do appreciate that. Look at Taylor Swift albums. My daughters want every color and every variant, so they're really leaning into the uh, the the vinyl collector and the music. Not to it's yeah. probably the first time, maybe ever, the Melvins and Taylor Swift were were compared. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the Melvins get compared quite a bit to the Beatles, right? 
Um, uh, Chris Cornell's favorite bands were the Beatles and the Melvins. That's what he told, um, you know, he was very outward with that. And Matt Cameron, when he was recently on the show, he told the whole story. He said, uh, you know, he probably couldn't get Paul McCartney for the Chris Cornell tribute, but he, he you know, he, he said the Melvins were really important um, to be there. And um, consequently, they've recorded a bunch of stuff together. But um, yeah, th- to me, Melvins are also another artist that they remind me of is Frank Zappa. Um, Zappa had so much variation around his catalog. I think 85 albums released in his lifetime, something like that. And um, I don't think Melvins have that many. But uh, there, there's different periods of Zappa that I gravitate towards. People tend to like, you know, particular eras of Zappa, at least at a time. We'll binge different eras. Sometimes the early freak out or we're only in it for the money. Sometimes, you know, Zuda lures. Sometimes, you know, some of the the uh, the, the jazz from hell, the Sinclavier stuff. Um, to me, Melvins have a very similar kind of trajectory. They'll 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 do records one way for a little while, and then they'll get bored and they'll want to change things up and and they'll evolve into something different. And you don't have to like everything, but there's kind of something in there as long as you have the right entry point into the Melvins catalog. Just like Frank Zappa, you'll you'll find your way to other eras if if it strikes you right. And that that journey, so to speak, for musically is a lot different than say like kiss or the rolling stones where you have disco albums K- kiss had their hair band stint and even a grunge album the, i mean they were doing it i think for much different reasons the melvin seems more you know, organic and just the art that they want to produce and if you like it buy it if you don't don't buy it and, and that it's you know a lot different than kiss or the, those other bands that change the styles as they go but it's really just kind of following whatever the musical trend is. And hopefully that statement didn't turn off Gene Simmons from ever being a podcast guest <laughs> in the future. Well, I think that there is a relationship though, between the Melvins and kiss. They did their, the Melvins did like the solo, they did the three solo albums like kiss did, and they've covered kiss on a few albums. So there must be some connection with kiss in, in the Melvins. Yeah, they, they, they do like, I think you couldn't be, our age and they are kind of our age well you guys are i think a little bit younger a little less gray than me but you you can't go through the 70s and 80s without being influenced or impacted by kiss in some way they were such a phenomenon and i've never been a kiss fan um but like you know you saw my christmas card this year right (laughs) with the um rock and roll uh, over rock and roll over yeah yeah uh, because they're so integral to the culture, especially American culture, um, you know, and they're, they're unabashed capitalists. That's clear, but loud. And, you know, um, they command the attention. And um, so whether you're a Kiss fan or not, you pretty much almost everyone knows who Kiss is. Uh, and uh, you've everyone's seen their artwork and been influenced in one way or another. I don't, I, don't, I think at what, I've probably owned two to three Kiss records in my life, um, and uh, but I uh, um, but I know all their works. I'm, I'm sure I'm influenced by them in, in ways beyond music. So, yeah, um, they also have good imagery, which uh, Melvins were keen to uh, leverage in a very cheeky way. The, the solo albums, I think, is the most brilliant um, example of that. Um, you brought it up, Paul. For people who don't know. In the late 70s, Kiss, well, Kiss released four solo albums, the, you know, one for each member. Uh, In the late 80s, early 90s, Melvin's released three solo albums, one for each member. And they're almost an exact homage down to the artwork, down to the record label, down to the poster that's in each record. Um, uh, so uh, I just I just talked to this guy Tom Flynn of Boner Records who put out those releases, and we talk about him putting those releases out. And yeah, it's 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 a brilliant parody of uh, of uh, of the Kiss solo albums. Yeah, that's cool. Did when uh, Melvin's did it? Did they do it like Kiss did, where each member did the album completely solo, like without the other members guest starring yeah. on there? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And at the time, they had a bass player, Joe Preston, and uh, I think that 
that may have been, I seem to recall this, a story where that was the moment they realized that Joe wasn't as into it as they were. <laughs> and um, I think that may have been the beginning of the end for Joe. But uh, yeah, the solo albums were the, uh, um, yeah, the same sort of approach. Again, down to the, to all, all little elements of the artwork and record label and everything. So for a uh, Melvin's naive listener, someone who yes. isn't familiar with their music catalog as opposed to their vinyl catalog, just their music catalog, which album would you recommend be their introduction to the Melvins? Maybe not the most popular album, but or it could be certainly, but maybe the album that you think is, is the best uh, example of what they are as a band and the, the, the door that would open uh, to a new fan to get into their music. Yeah. So there's there's two records I'd, I'd recommend. Their most popular album, uh, I think, is also one of the more accessible ones, Houdini. I think people have, have seen that album around. It's pretty, pretty popular. The artwork is um, pretty ubiquitous with 90s music. It was actually... It, so they were on small labels um, the first part of their career. Uh, originally CZ and then to Boner Records for about four releases. And then the great, you know, grunge signing started and uh, um, Atlantic Records signed Melvin's for three albums. Uh, and those albums are Houdini, Stag, and Stoner Witch. Um, that was their, their Atlantic period. Uh, and after those three albums, they returned back to other labels like Ipecac and, and a few others. So we, we can go through those as well. Mm -hmm. But the first of the Atlantic albums was Houdini. That was produced, well, I, in air quotes, produced by Kurt Cobain. He, or he was involved in the production. From all accounts, he pretty much was just nodding out on this couch for most of the most of the recording mm -hmm. sessions. That couch, by the way, is in the Punk Rock Museum in uh, Las Vegas. You can go sit on it if you oh, want. Okay. There's pictures of Melvin's and Kurt Cobain and Kurt sleeping on the couch and everything while they're doing Houdini. Um, so Houdini is uh, their, uh, I think, the their most well-known work. Um, if you want to start with one song, probably Honey Bucket. <laughs> That's the one that uh, I think they play. They still play it just about every show now because it just gets the crowd going. Um, but another album I want to call out is A Senile Animal. And A Senile Animal is uh, an album they recorded, oh, geez, in the early 2000s, I think. 2000, you're going to make me work now. Um, uh, where is it? And I want to say like, 2012 or so they had uh the big business guys in the band so they had two drummers and um uh the album a senile animal is just as heavy as it can be it sounds great the songwriting is i think top form um they don't mess around it, on a lot of melvin stuff you'll you'll hear heavy songs and really light songs and sometimes goofy songs and strange songs They'll mix it up, which I think keeps it interesting. But this, but this album is just straight ahead. If you know, if you don't want to screw around with some of the more esoteric stuff. You're not ready for it. Try a senile animal. That'll, that'll pretty much be uh, an adventure from beginning to end for you. I'll check that out. 2006. Okay. 2006. Out. Okay. All right. Went too far off. So my the first uh, first item I ever found of a Melvin's uh, album, I actually, admittedly, this was years ago. I bought because I saw it in a, a record store, and I was fascinated by the fact that it's you know it's it's a Boner Records single, but the way that it is clearly a, a sub pop homage. They even did the Boner record in the in the sub pop. Yes, and I was, and I actually was confused. It took me a while to find out that they actually aren't related to sub pop. 
That's a that's a uh, mud honey cover, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's if you look at mud honey, touch me, I'm sick. It's the exact same picture. And ah. in fact, it's funny you bring this up because on next week's episode, well, by the time this goes, it's last week's episode. Um, uh, Tom Flynn of Boner Records talks about that very release. And oh yeah, how they worked with Sub Pop and they. Yeah, they just lifted that exact picture from a Mud Honey release. Oh, and, see, yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, there's like Look. there's like a hundred different variants of that. They printed yeah. seven hundred copies on a hundred different colors. Oh, really? So see, there's like a that, there's like a ton of different color versions yeah. of it. He, yeah, he tells one. I just yeah. He tells the story. They went to the record plant and they just said, "Just print us X amount." using whatever you have, which is actually really good for a record company because they have different colors in their, in the hoppers when they press the records. And it's always difficult from what I understand to get rid of all the colors to do the next fresh batch. Like if you're doing blue records and then you have to go to red, you have to get all the blue pellets yeah. through the system first to start doing the red. But if someone says, just print me whatever, just to have fun with it, then that's that's great for them because they, they don't have to be as conscientious about that changeover. Um, so there's a few things to know about Melvin Records. Um, now, there, I think Melvin's still control all the music that they've made, or most, uh, I should say. I don't know if that's 100% true, but most of it. So the labels that they still work with um, uh, they're able to manage, you know, where, where their music is, uh, is, is uh, um, pressed by or where it's, um, you know, physical copies are, are made from. They have a big connection at the moment with Ipecac records, which is a label that is partially owned by Mike Patton of faith. No more. Um, it's also owned by a guy named Greg Workman and Ipecac has um, a huge catalog, a lot of music that I really, really like, and, and Melvin's fit perfectly in there. But they also do side pressings with a, um, a few different companies, one of which is Amphetamine Reptile. And that's owned by and run by a guy named Tom Hazelmeyer. And they do art, kind of art records through Tom. Tom's an artist, and he does these wood carvings uh and uh, or lino cuts i think they're called and he's got a very unique style and whenever melvin's come out with a record they'll have a small number pressed just for the amphetamine reptile release to have a they'll have unique covers and, and things like that so um i do have a few of those records if you want me to share them i know most yeah. people can't see these but um They've got an they've got an album called Pincus Abortion Technician, and if you look at the album cover where it's you know from I think it's released on Ipecac, it's very different than the um, one that Tom Hazelmeyer did. Very similar kind of subject matter, but just Tom's own style, his lino cut style in here. Uh, these records are printed probably three to four hundred each, sometimes as low as one hundred. And they're they're mail order only, or they're available only at Melvin's gigs. It's generally not something you can go into a shop and buy. So Melvin's collectors tend to go pretty apeshit over uh, AMRAP uh, versions of their music. Yeah, that's cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Do you have neat that the album they put out with them while they were signed by Atlantic? It wasn't released in the U.S. Um, Prick, it's called. Which one, Prick? Yeah. So yeah, they put, it, they put it out in '94 while they were still under contract with Atlantic. So on the cover, Melvin's is in a mirror instead of saying Melvin's. It's like the mirrored version of it, Snivellum or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So so they're not technically Melvin's because of that. And uh, I don't think I think it was only released in Germany. It wasn't pressed in the United States until later. It maybe right. reissue, but in the '90s it was only released in Germany. But that was, I yeah. thought that was kind of a cool little piece of history that they kind of got around the record deal by releasing that and overseas with that with the mirrored version of melvin's yeah they they've they've had a, quite a few records that are very um i guess perhaps attracted the wrong attention um like uh they had a release called lysol did you 
You, you know, yeah, that, that. I, yeah. I was going to bring that. That one's been one of my want lists to get. And I learned about it actually on your podcast. I think probably one of the, the older interviews they were talking about it where they put black tape over there. They started printing them and it said Lysol on it. And then they got a cease and desist. And so they already had them all printed. So they just put a piece of black tape over it. So I've been, yeah. I've been seeking out one without the black tape. Uh, it's assuming that that was kind of a rare, rarer, and kind of snuck out the the back door. Mm-hmm. I don't. Do you have it? Do you have any of those? Or did I did I characterize that correctly? You said that, yeah, almost uh, perfectly. I don't think, uh, yeah, not a whole lot to add to it. Um, I I don't think that uh, there were that many that got out without the tape um, over the word Lysol, because uh, obviously the corporation who owns Lysol at Johnson and Johnson or whatever, they didn't want the product name on there for whatever reason. Um, I think most copies you'll see of Lysol, someone's taken that black tape and rolled it off. So very carefully, very similar to like a butcher cover. Right. So, Mm. yeah, so that's, yeah. um, But you know, they, 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 they tend to go out and provoke quite, quite a reaction as you can tell from them just taking the cover of a mud honey record, putting it on their record, right. Or they'll use the kiss low kiss army logo to make Melvin's army or something like that. So, yeah, this, this is another example of, of a Tom Hazelmeyer version. This is Melvin's version of who, of uh, this is the AMREP version of Houdini. And if you've seen the Houdini album cover, you know, it's, you know, two kids um, sitting with a, with a, a two headed puppy. Um, this is very different than that. It, the the kids are the mutants and the puppy is not. Um, but this is a yeah special a special version. I think there's only a couple hundred of these printed. This, this 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 these are quite collectible. They look awesome yeah. for the listeners. The there's a, the girl has three eyes. The boy has one eye, and the dog is completely normal. And it's yeah. super vivid, super super vivid colors: purple, green, uh, black, and red. Mm-hmm. It just looks awesome. It's, it's, it looks fantastic. Now, one thing to know about this is this is, you see that label? Oh, Third Man. Third Man. Yeah, it's put up up by Third Man. Now, Third Man Records, who we all know, Jack White and and those guys, um, uh, they were the the only label, well, I don't say they're the only label, but they were the successful label at being able to lobby Atlantic Records to license the music for them to print uh, records of. it's you know with the three albums they have on atlantic um it's you've probably heard the story of a lot of artists have is it you know when the the music that they had at a major label uh when it goes out of print it's hard for them to get the rights back uh but third man through ben blackwell went reached out to atlantic and made the deal that third man can be printing those three melvin's records for a certain period of time so th- that was the version that was, um, yeah, there's a limited version from Tom Hazel with Tom Hazelmeyer artwork, but, uh, but anyone today going out and buying a brand new copy of Houdini, um, it's probably was most definitely a third man, uh, record. Very cool. Very cool. So, um, as we wrap this up or get close to wrapping it up. Uh, if we like to limit it to about an hour, mostly because my editing skills are subpar <laughs> um, and anything over an hour is, will take me about three months to edit. Right. So um, what we do is we like to pick one album that if you were to say, you know, if uh, the average uh, record collector was trying to put together the perfect record collection. Now, maybe it doesn't have to be the most valuable record collection, but it has to be the, the collection that is going to be most inclusive uh, of the great records of all time. And, and someone, if they were to meet any, you know, audiophile or, or vinyl collector would say, well, I know you have a good record collection, but do you have this one? Mm-hmm. Which one do you think would be most important uh, from the, the Melvin's catalog? Chad, go ahead. But before... Just like the uh, the last one we did, let's let us let's go around the horn and give Nate the the final say. Examples, yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually yeah. before and, we and get to that, if, I had I had a question for Nate because I was just reading up on some stuff. Then I just discovered uh, 
uh, Melvin's release that I didn't know about. I, I'm a pretty big Mother Love Bone fan. Mm-hmm. And they released a single, it must have been right after Andrew Wood died, of a cover of With Your With Your Heart, Not Your Hands, the song that they that Malfunction plays on Deep Six. Okay. And they put out a single of that and like on a couple different colors. It's it must be super limited. But I just thought it was cool as an as an Andrew Wood and Mother Love Bone fan. Uh, I don't know if you had that or knew anything about it. Um, oh, with the yellow cover, I actually I don't have that. See, that's that's another thing about Melvin's is it's it's they're so prolific. They have so many records, and we're only we only we barely scratched the surface here um, with just a, a couple of the LPs. They've got a ton of forty fives. That they'll put out there, and they'll do yeah. a they'll do a a series of you know seven or eleven different forty five singles that you have to collect if you're a nut like me. So there's a lot of them that a lot of records that they that that still elude my collection. Um, I'm familiar with this in your heart, not your hands. Um, in fact, uh, I'm friends with the guy who did the cover art with it, Brian Walsby. Um, wow. but, uh, but yeah, there's, you know, no one, no one has every Melvin's thing. It's, that's impossible by, I think like that would be, uh, um, that would be a heavy, heavy, <laughs> um, project. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, there's, it's, yeah, that's what label is that on sympathy for the record industry. Okay. 1990. Yep. Yeah. All right, Chad. So. You had mentioned maybe we could. I mean, to me, as a as a uh, a novice Melvin's fan, um, I would think, and and I would hope Nate would veto this if it's incorrect. Yeah. But my my <laughs> general sense would be that Houdini would be the album that you know a just a someone who's collecting vinyl in general would kind of gear themselves towards getting uh, the 93 pressing of Houdini simply because it is, it's a 93 rock vinyl, which makes it not easy to find in great shape. And it's also their uh, most recognizable album, uh, both, both musically and physically as a vinyl records, the most, most um, recognizable album. So that would have been my, you know, the, the, my choice, off the top of my head, Chad and Paul, what would your thoughts have been? Mine would have been, I, I'm kind of in the kind of like a historian type. I like their early stuff of, of bands. Uh, mine would be the, the gluey port street mits, the misprinted label where buzzes and Matt's names are mixed up mm. uh, on the back. Um, it's not super, super rare. It's not super, super expensive, but I think that's cool. And I think that album is just really important, the Glue Porch album. So that was now I'm gonna sound like I am completely unprepared. That was exactly the one I was gonna mention as well. <laughs> it was the mystery? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did. Uh it, my and similar reasons. I like early stuff. Uh if there's not one particular album that's that's really iconic. I real I'll gravitate to the early stuff. That was their first uh, their first full length album released from that era, that Seattle, you know, niche that that made up what grunge would become. And I'm also a sucker for errors and the fact that they had the names mixed up, which is pretty easy error to to see, and it's kind of cool on the back where it has it the wrong name under the wrong um, the the wrong band member. So. That was going to be mine too, Paul. So you really made me look foolish, and I didn't need much help. <laughs> well, I I don't think there's any wrong answer because there's so many answers to that question, to me anyway. Um, I'm going to go very different because I I recognize the value in, in each of the records you guys named, uh, and you're not wrong. Um, but the one record I think it's a collection. Can I pick a collection of records? Sure. Because they do, like I say, stunts uh, with some of their releases. And one of them, which you can see right up there, is called Endless Residency. You see that one right there? Yeah. Um, that is a box set, eight records. 
Oh, eight, eight, eight physical records, I think. Um, and inside it, it, it's a collection. There was only a hundred made. It's in a wooden box. Me. You guys can see it here. It is a wooden box that was made by um, uh, Tom Hazelmeyer. Well, he ordered it anyway. Um, and there was a limit of 100 of these made. Uh, each of them has artwork, unique artwork. Uh, so here's Houdini, for example. Um, it's gatefold. Uh, Melvin's drew on all of these things, so they just kind of laid them out, and each of them kind of just scribbled names and different, uh, you know, whatever they felt like writing at the time they did. So this, to many Melvin's collectors, is the Holy Grail. Um, and it's great because it, they took each of these albums, Houdini, Bullhead, um, Lysol, and Stoner Witch, and they played them live. So these are live recordings. So I think the only place to be able to get these, well, they got some CD versions out, but on uh, on vinyl are these these pressings that go into. There's a wooden box version and a cardboard box version. Uh, the cardboard box version still goes for four or five hundred bucks. The wood box, uh, probably two grand, twenty five hundred, something like that. Yeah, I'm on uh, pop psych. I'm on pop psych right now. It's definitely four figures. Um, yeah. We're in the looks like between uh, more around fifteen hundred um, for the ones that sold in the last few. Actually, that was two thousand fourteen. So uh, that's actually a long time ago. I don't know what it goes for now. Yeah, yeah. Are both is the wooden box the limited to one hundred or both combined one hundred? No, limited. Uh, wooden boxes is one hundred. I think there's a couple cardboard boxes. Uh, black vinyl and orange vinyl. I think the orange vinyl cardboard box is maybe two hundred, and the black is five hundred. I think. Okay. Yeah these 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 wood box sales are at least ten years old, and I don't see any that are within the last ten years. And um, they are back then were fourteen hundred, so it's got to be two to you know two thousand to twenty five hundred by now. I, would I, assume. I, I I'm part of a Melvin's vinyl collectors Facebook page and uh, you know, people always kind of show, show their wares and, and it's a nice community because people are always trying to get stuff for each other there, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's nice when people are looking out for each other. It's not just a kind of a dollar grab. Right. Um, and you know, every so often you'll see someone say, Oh my God, I finally got one. You know, they'll thank someone on the site for helping them locate one. But there's only a hundred of these. And, um, Tom Hazelmeyer came on the show last year and told the story of this and how he had to drive some manufacturing place in Texas to get the wood boxes made and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, that's if people want to hear the origin story uh, we've got of that box set, Tom Hazelmeyer tells that story on our podcast. But yeah, that's, that's really cool. I mean, that's the whole, that's, that's the Melvin's kind of Holy grail and they're great recordings and they're great. It's, it's of some of their greatest work. So it all, it all kind of, coalesces there very, very good cool. so there it is so, so, so nate i guess before we wrap up is there anything i know like you said we scratched the surface and we only have about an hour but is there anything that we grossly miss that melvin's collectors should know and should seek out oh yeah we grossly missed a lot um <laughs> there's so much that's the thing <laughs> the melvin's well is deep and, and we're only hitting the very top top of it. And and again, Houdini is, uh, you know, it is their most popular work and probably through its association with Kurt Cobain and and um, and that era that it was released. Um, that seems to attract a lot of attention. But the rest of their catalog is fantastic. And to me, it's every every record is um, a different record, almost a kind of a, a different band right and a different approach and and that's what i love about this band they're the triangulation of you know creativity heavy music um record collecting and uh, being prolific to me they take all the boxes and uh, and i'm very excited because they're finally coming back to australia and i'm going to get to see them uh in a couple weeks um so uh yeah it's they're they're one of the only bands where i've changed an international flight just to see 
Uh, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I can't say enough good stuff about Melvin's and, uh, God, I hope they, I, I hope they're still doing it 20 years from now. Very cool. So in our, in our podcast, uh, promo or however we list it, how sh- should we say Melvin's or the Melvin's? I'd say Melvin's because the Melvin's will make, uh, um, Melvin's collectors raise an eyebrow. Um, I think if, if you if you say the Melvins, yeah, you wouldn't want to just say Melvins. I would just say Melvins. <laughs> Duly noted, but you got that. Avoid the issue. I got yeah. you. People who say the Melvins won't care if it's Melvins. People who say Melvins will care if it's the Melvin. So. I feel like I, I feel like I'm you know creating enemies because Deep Six says the Melvins, and I feel like that that sets the stage for saying the Melvins forever. <laughs> You, you know who know. definitely calls them the Melvins? Dave Mustaine. Probably. <laughs> no. Probably. Chad's, Chad's trying to create a Dave Mustaine grudge. It's, uh, <laughs> <Why>? it's <laughs> a little fun. <laughs> just, just for no reason whatsoever. He's never met the man just trying to create a grudge. It's a little forced. All right. But, hey. but that gives okay. you an idea of how, how important Melvins are is because all these different artists kind of point to him and say, that's that's what I was listening to, or that's someone that I wanted to be, you know, they really, you know, they, they, uh, if you hear again, I hate, I hate name dropping or anything, but you know, Matt Cameron was on our show and he was talking about, you know, Melvin's are the first band who really slowed it down, made it heavy, made it sludgy. You know, they took punk rock and really just kind of slowed it. And I think they're completely unique to me. They're on the same level as black Sabbath in terms of their innovation. Right. Well, Black Sabbath brought in with this very dark, moody music. Uh, Melvin's kind of did something very similar, but I think they also had a lot more, oh. rather than blues rock, they had a lot more Beatles sensibility and, and uh, melodicism maybe in it. I know I'm starting to sound like a real wanker here, but you know I can't overstate the importance of Melvin's and where I think they fit in the whole musical landscape. Yeah, and don't be shy about name dropping. We love name dropping. See, it's different when you name drop because you actually have talked and met these people, uh, you know, and, and met these people. Right. We just name drop, for, hoping to hit some sort of algorithm that will uh, <laughs> allow somebody to listen to us. So uh, Taylor Swift, uh, Paul McCartney, and uh, Elton John, and those—that's our—that's our name drop for no reason. I just hopefully just oh. some sort of algorithm that's going to irrelevant name gonna, drop. Okay. Yeah, irrelevant name drop. Um. Yeah, so thank you so much for coming. Uh, hope to have you back in the future, and we can talk some more. Uh, we will continue listening again uh, to the list for the listeners. It is called the Vinyl Guide. It is a must listen. Um, I want to thank uh, Jacob Harwood for our intro and outro music. Uh, great guitarist who just happens to be my son, and is thirteen years old. Yeah, thanks to all our listeners as they continue to grow. Any questions, please feel free to uh, drop a line or send an email over. Uh, you can visit us and submit your albums at www.vmgvinyl.com. And until next time, uh, this is Butch with Chad and Paul and our guest Nate saying adios. Adios. Adios.